Eighth indictment, there is a void of serious teaching about holiness. My dear friend, general teaching on holiness, everyone agrees. Let's be holy. We need to be more holy. Let's have a holiness conference. But when you get specific about what that means, if God truly converts a man, He will continue working in that man through teaching and blessing and admonition and discipline. He will see to it that the work He has begun will be finished. And that's why the writer says, without sanctification, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Why? Because if there's no growth in holiness, God's not working in your life. Now, there's so much teaching on this, but let me just say this. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 and go on to 2. Your bodies, why does he say body? I think to avoid all this super spirituality. Well, I've given Jesus my heart. And you can't judge a book by its cover. Well, as a matter of fact, you can judge a book by its cover. Jesus never said you couldn't judge a book by its cover. He said you could. You will know them by their fruit. And if you think that you've given him your heart, then he will have your body. And I'll tell you why. The heart, my friend, is not some blood pumping muscle or some figment of a poet's imagination. It refers to the very essence or core of your being. Don't tell me Jesus has the very essence and core of your being and it doesn't affect your body. It's just not going to happen. And so what do we do? We go through Scripture. What? Legalistically? No. Drawing inferences? No. Just standing on the commands of Scripture. I love the Puritans. And one of the reasons why I love them, because I believe they honestly made an attempt to bring everything in their life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Their mind. Because they wrote 800 page books on what should I think about according to the scriptures? What should not enter into my mind according to the scriptures? What should I do with my eyes? What should go in these ears and what should not go in these ears? How should the tongue be ruled? What should be the direction of my life? And yes, I'm going to scare you to death. How should I dress? Now, I can't go through everything of holiness, and holiness isn't just outward expression, but we've become to be a people that uses the interior work of the Spirit as an excuse to say nothing is ever going to happen on the outside. And that is not true. Some of you young men, you cry out probably more than I do that the Spirit of God would fill you and work in you, but it only takes one half hour of television to so grieve Him, He'll be a miles from you. 99% pure, 1% sewer, I'm not drinking. There's a story of a, one of the finest, greatest violinists in Europe playing his final concert, old man. And when he finished, a young man walked up to him, violinist, and said, Sir, I'd give my life to play like you. And the old man said, Son, I have given my life to play like me. I want the power of God on my life, then something's got to go. I want to know Him, then some separation has to occur. Let me tell you something, young man. Everyone else is running around to all their little retreats and all their conferences and getting together with group hugs and singing Kumbaya and everything else. Maybe you need to get alone in the wilderness with God and fast for seven days on your knees studying the book of Psalms. It's being alone with God, belonging to Him silence and separation. I think, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Nothing. What fellowship has light with darkness? Nothing. Darkness is the opposite of God's revelation. Or what harmony? Christ with Belial? Nothing. Or what has the believer in common with the unbeliever? Nothing. He says, come out from their midst. Come out from the midst of what? Come out from the midst of lawlessness, darkness, satanic devices, and the life and worldliness of the unbeliever. Come out from it.